talk, and then I'm totally mess it up from now on. Um, yes, the one thing I have to get used to is this uh, head restraint, which you call a microphone here, but uh, apart from that, I'm totally comfortable and ready to go. So, uh, what I want to talk about today is uh, some observations and speculations on the relationship between two tasks which are often regarded as fairly separate, uh, summarization and retrieval diversity. And uh, one has been looked at more recently, and if they both come from information retrieval, they're both defined as tasks in the information retrieval domain. Uh, the uh, NLP community took over summarization fairly early on, it's been doing a lot of work in that area. Um, and the retrieval community has been focusing more recently on diversity. Uh, but I, and that includes my group as well, been focusing on retrieval diversity. And uh, as we did that, we just noticed that there seems to be interesting relationships between these two things. And that's really what I'll be talking about today. And as I said, some of these things are just speculations, just observations of interest, and a lot of it is not. Here's the conclusive uh, statement about this, and this is uh, the, the last result we need to have in this area. It's really we're really pointing to where we need to look more into it. Okay, so I'm going to talk really briefly about summarization and diversity, and then talk, start talking about the relationship between summarization and diversity. I'm going to focus on a, an approach to retrieval diversity called term-based diversity, which we proposed uh, last year, and uh, a summarization te which is technique which is used in that approach called DSP approx, and uh, then talk about how we go beyond that to learning to rank approach, and then another task where we are using this blend of summarization diversity uh, to look at the uh, task of opinion mining with social data. And uh, as you can see, uh, conclusions with a question mark, meaning they don't have any real firm conclusions, but I'll have a last slide anyway at some point. Okay, so summarization. There's my summary of summarization. Uh, think this is the sort of things that people have looked at uh, in the NLP community and IR community over the years when they've looked at summarization and it's not an exhaustive list uh, but it covers some of the dimensions of the tasks that they've looked at. Uh, single document summarization versus multi-document summarization. I think that's self-explanatory. Um, query bias summaries versus query independent summaries. So query bias summaries, one version of that you would be a snippet on the result list. Uh, but uh, typically it's selecting, doing something like selecting sentences or parts of a document uh, with respect to a particular query after that document has been retrieved by a query. Versus query independent summarization where the task is are okay, given this document or group of documents summarized without, uh, without regard to any particular query, just based on its own content. And, uh, for example, news summary <coughs> systems where you're trying to summarize a stream of news stories coming in. You don't have any specific queries there, you're just trying to summarize whatever the content is of the news articles coming in. Uh, extracted summaries versus generated summaries. So extractive summarization is really what the, most people have focused on for a long time, which is basically pulling text out of the documents to generate a summary, like a snippet, for example. Most of the text comes out of the, uh, in a snippet comes out of the document itself, uh, or in the metadata, uh, versus a generative summary, which is where maybe the NLP community started with, which is how we take a, uh, a, a piece of text, generate a representation of that text, uh, I mean, uh, analyze it in order to generate a, a, some sort of meaning representation of the text and then use text generation approaches to generate a short summary of what that, whatever that meaning representation was that we analyzed the text from. Uh, so that was certainly studied a lot in the 80s, but uh, it hasn't been focused on all that much uh, lately. And finally, how do we evaluate this stuff? It's task-based evaluation versus example-based evaluation. By, by task-based evaluation, I mean that you come up with a task that you want to use the summary for, 
and evaluate different summaries by how well they accomplish that task. So if you want people to be able to find relevant information based on the snippet, and you have two different snippet generation algorithms, then you can just do things like you know, put it out on the web and see how many, what things people click on and whether the people are missing relevant data uh, with one type of snippet more often than they're missing the relevant data with another type of snippet as a way of comparing the snippet generation algorithm. An example based uh, evaluation is more the Rouge style of evaluation where you have a uh, you have somebody generates uh, examples of handwritten summaries. Um, one, maybe just one summary, maybe uh, a sample of summaries, and uh, then you compare your, the, the generated summaries to those gold standard summaries using some measure. Um, and typically it's an n-gram based measure like Rouge is being used a lot in the literature. And that was very successful for training up systems translation systems too, uh, use a similar sort of approach in terms of evaluation where you have um, gold standard translations and machine generated translations and you compare them by looking at various measures of n-gram overlap. Okay, so that's my summarization summary. Uh, diversity summary, the re retrieval diversity, the basic idea is you start with a, a query like satellite and you do relevant sort of topical based retrieval. I'm going to ignore all the other types of features that we use in retrieval, such as anchor text, link patterns, all that sort of stuff. Let's just focus on the word part for the time being. Uh, so one of the, the models, the, the, type, the main type of model that we have in, uh, in uh, relevance based retrieval focuses on topical relevance, which says, are these text documents topically relevant to this query? estimate the probability of that. Uh, the problem with that type of query is that satellite has multiple possible query intents or underlying aspects or underlying topics and all those are different ways of describing the same thing, which means that it might mean different things to different people. Uh, and we might have, for example, documents about actual satellites in space that some people are interested in. Uh, documents about satellite radio that some people are interested in, and uh, documents about satellite uh, mapping uh, that other people are interested in. And uh, so the whole point of retrieval diversity algorithms is that given as something like a single word query, uh, then it can have multiple possible intents. And so instead of uh, just going with the most popular intent, whatever the, retrie the topical retrieval algorithm pulls up, uh, we try and specifically reason about what are the underlying intents that exist for this query, and then say, and then have an algorithm which divers diversifies the ranking with respect to those underlying intents. Okay, so there's two main tasks that we have to tackle there is what are these underlying intents? We have to infer what they are because nobody's going to tell them to us. And then we have to diversify the ranking in some way with respect to those intents. Okay, so uh, with commercial search engines, uh, there's a lot of academic work on this. There's also these types of algorithms are embedded in the retrieval processes in commercial engines as well. Uh, and uh, uh, so I'll, I'll talk about this and then talk about how summarization sort of overlaps with some of this. So here's the text-based summary of uh, diversity. Uh, when we talk about the algorithms for diversifying the rank list, the result list, uh, given a set of underlying aspects, uh, there's a few different approaches. The oldest one, uh, MMR, was actually invented here a long time ago. Uh, maximal marginal relevance, which basically says uh, rank the first document by topical relevance, then choose the next document, then choose it so that it is uh, the highest ranked document that has the least similarity to the document you've just retrieved. So you're always comparing the document both to the query and to the documents you've already retrieved. 
because uh, you're trying to minimize redundancy. You don't want to retrieve another document that looks like one that you've already found. So that's a pretty simple idea. There's no notion of aspects there. It's all essentially each document represents itself. And so you're just trying to minimize redundancy between documents that way. And more recently, we've got frameworks like XQuad and PM2. XQuad came from Glasgow, PM2 from uh, UMass. They're diff different emphasis on, uh, on what you're trying to optimize in this diverse result list. Uh, XQuad is trying to minimize redundancy, somewhat similar to maximal marginal relevance, uh, except that it's redundancy with respect to a, a set of underlying topics, not with respect to previous documents. The difference between documents and the underlying topics or aspects. But it's still trying to minimize that redundancy of coverage. And PM2 proportionality is trying to maximize proportionality, which means that if we run a, a stupid query, and these are stupid queries, but unfortunately a lot of people use them, like the query Java, uh, then uh, the underlying aspects of that sort of uh, stereotype query are obviously the programming language and uh, the island and coffee and maybe some other ones as well. But 95% of the documents on the web about Java are about the Java programming language. And then there's some number about the, uh, quite a few about the island and some quite, obviously quite a lot about the coffee too, but nowhere near as many, uh, near, near as, many uh, as about the Java programming language just because a lot of computer, computer people write a lot of the stuff on the web. So the proportionality measure is just trying to reflect that and saying, okay, what is the ideal, say, top 10 rank list when we're trying to come up with a criteria for optimizing diversity. Um, the proportionality measures try to optimize diversity, but also respect proportionality in the sense that we should have a lot of documents about Java reflecting the probability that a document is about the Java programming language. I mean, a lot of documents about the programming language, but also some smaller number about the other possible aspects. So it's just somewhat different emphasis. Um, Okay, explicit topics versus, I said the maximal marginal relevance method doesn't have explicit topics, it uses documents as representations of themselves. XQuad, on the other hand, PM2 to some extent, assumes that we have knowledge of the aspects for a query. In fact, in the TREK evaluations, you are given the underlying aspects, which are generated in various ways. Uh, and so we have this notion of, well, where do we get these underlying aspects or topics from? Uh, so are they defined in some way or do we have to generate them? Uh, in the track diversity track, they're given to you, although they have also been generated in different ways. Sometimes uh, people have used Google suggestions for a query as being saying on the assumption that the query suggestions you get from Google for a query are covering the underlying aspects or the underlying intents for a given query. So that was their assumption there when using that. Another method is uh, to use the open directory project categories and say for that topic and say, okay, this is a sort of an ontology related to that topic and so that gives us some idea of what subtopics we should cover. Or we can do something uh, more of a text analytic flavor and cluster the top ranked documents say that there must be topics related to each of these clusters. Okay, but that's another dimension of the research here. And finally, we also have the evaluation dimension. And we have standard relevance evaluations using measures like NDCG and MAP that a lot of you would have seen in classes, etc. And when we evaluate retrieval diversity, we have similar measures, but we also have to reflect and measure on how well you're covering the underlying aspects. Uh, so alpha NDCG is a version of NDCG where you're discounting by how well you're covering uh, aspects as in addition to how far down the ranking you are. And uh, ERR, IA means intent aware ERR, so it's a version of this ERR measure which once again is measuring how well you're covering the set of underlying aspects. So anyway, so there's my summary of summarization and in terms of the sorts of research people do and 
diversity in the sorts of people research, uh, that do research on there. Uh, so, uh, is there a relationship between the two? Uh, well, there's one sort of surface level thing where you say, well, they look, look they're very similar because uh, summarization evaluations in the past have actually talked about aspects as part of the goal of the summarization algorithm. There's a thing called attack evaluation where it says participants and human summarizers, remember we're doing this uh, evaluation by comparing to human summaries, uh, are given a list of aspects for each category and summary must include all aspects found for its category. Uh, but it's not really the same because they have a, a, an area like accidents and natural disasters. This is a category in their language. And then they have their uh, aspects which are what, when, where, why, who affected, damages, countermeasures. So these are like features of that event. Uh, and yeah, they are aspects too, but they're not the aspects in the sense of subtopics or different intents that we talk about in retrieval diversity. Um, so it's similar, but it's not exactly the same. But it's certainly true that when we talk about generating summaries, we certainly have some notion of coverage going on. It would be a fairly poor summary if it wasn't covering it's all the important things that are being said in this piece of text. Right? And you also, on the other hand, you can't cover everything, otherwise you have the entire text again. So you have to make some selections about what things do I cover and what things don't I cover. So there is some, also this same notion of coverage in summarization. Uh, summarization uh, can be used as part of diversification. In other words, uh, remember one of the steps in diversification algorithms is to infer what are the underlying aspects. Uh, if we do uh, certain types of summarization algorithms, maybe we can use that as input to this process of summarizing, of, uh, of uh, hypothesizing what the underlying aspects are. And uh, to also, diversification techniques, because they focus explicitly on uh, coverage, they may be useful for summarization, because some summarization algorithms, although they uh, talk a lot about um, that we need to cover. There's not as much, perhaps, explicit reasoning about coverage uh, in, the, in those algorithms, and so it might be useful to bring in diversification algorithms to summarization. Uh, as I said, I don't have any definitive conclusions yet, but we're going to explore some of the relationships in the remainder of the talk. Okay, so what I'm going to, what I'm going to show you to explain how uh, these things are related, at, at least at one, at one level, is to talk about an approach to diversification that we uh, proposed last year. It's called term level diversification. So the normal diversification process is you start with a query like joints, and this is a family friendly example, so we never infer any aspect having to do with uh, drugs or matters. Um, so we start with a uh, query of joints. And, and uh, somehow or other, we know that there's two underlying aspects related to that, treating joint pain and woodwork joint types. Uh, and uh, hope we need some sort of way of generating these high-level aspects or topics in order to say, OK, there seems to be two high-level topics that we're dealing with here, subtopics. And then once we had those underlying topics, we would feed them into our diversification algorithm which would proceed to estimate how much each document is related to those topics and diversify the result list based on those, knowing those two topics as being the related topics. Uh, what we uh, generate a diverse ranking. Uh, that should be probably a green, that one there should probably be green to be consistent in colouring. So this is uh, doing things at the topic level, this high level topic level. And so the big problem there is how do we infer those high-level topics? Uh, and we use an existing, uh, uh, existing diversification algorithm for that. So how do we infer those high-level topics? As I said, one way is to do clustering. We could use a technique like LDA or K-nearest neighbor, cluster the top-ranked documents. And uh, various people have looked at that as a way of inferring these high-level topics. 
Uh, other people have tried to infer the topics by looking at query logs. Uh, clustering anchor text is another way you might do it. Uh, and combining all of these things. That's standard IR approach. When in doubt, combine everything. That's what it usually works better. But it hasn't worked that well. Okay, these are all reasonable approaches. The results say that this doesn't work that well. It's actually pretty difficult to infer these high, this high level, one of the high level topics associated with a, uh, with a query. So uh, instead, uh, what we do in this term level diversification is to say, well, let's forget about inferring these high level topics where this vocabulary is grouped into these high level concepts. Instead, can we infer a set of the important vocabulary related to the top ranked documents? So we don't want to, you know, the difference is uh, we're still inferring something about the vocabulary. Uh, about the uh, top ranked documents. But in this case, we just want to say, well, can you give me a list of the most important vocabulary for this set of retrieved documents? And that's different than saying, what are the high level aspects, the subtopics related to this query? In some ways, this might be a uh, simpler task. That we propose that this might be a simpler task. And this task, given a set of documents, give me a list of terms, words, or phrases that are uh, important for that set of documents is exactly multi-document summarization. When summarizing, when you're generating summaries that are term-based or phrase-based, that's one of the types of summaries you can generate. You can generate word-based summaries, phrase-based summaries, sentence-based summaries, passage-based summaries, etc. But this is a summarization problem, is to say what is the best set of terms to summarize this group of documents, multi-document summarization. So we are proposing, sorry about the animation, uh, we, we propose that this would be easier to do. So, in fact, the first thing we tried was, okay, we'll take the track topics which are given to us, you know, they basically say a, a query to represent each, they give you a text query which represents each of the underlying uh, subtopics. And uh, this is using the diversity framework PM2. And in one case, the topic based one, you have to uh, work out the probability that a document is about this topic. The term base of QL here is the query likelihood which does no diversification, does a standard uh, relevance ranking, not using phrases or anything, using an independence model. Uh, and this is, a, this is a diversity evaluation, we're using ERR, in, intent aware. So it shows you that uh, using this diversification framework with known topics uh, and estimating how, the problem, how each document is related to the topic, we can in fact improve the diversity of the result list substantially. But if we just ignore, not ignore the topics, but just take all the words from those topic queries and jumble them all up and say, here's a bunch of words, which came from that, instead of saying, here's a list of topic queries, here's a bunch of words that were described as topics, and diversify it just with respect to those words, we get uh, an insignificant difference in performance. So it's small, in fact, it's insignificant. So that's with known, when, when we know the underlying aspects in the form of a query describing each aspect. So it didn't, it, knowing how those words group together into concepts, and phrasal concepts, didn't help us at all, in effect, for, for, for diversification. So, uh, as I said, where do we get the, oh, I must have missed the, okay. There's another slide somewhere later on which says, oh well, yeah, I know when it comes, I'll say it for later. So where do we get those topic terms from? As I said, this is multi-document summarization using what, asking what are the important words and phrases. Uh, so we just want to generate terms. Some algorithms of this type generate hierarchical summaries. And they actually can be useful because when you think of that horrible example of Java, and you get back, there's a million documents about Java program. 
because when you consider Java programming, there's actually a lot of different subtopics under that as well. Uh, do you want sort of tutorials about Java programming? Do you want uh, the latest systems that you want to buy or something like that? There's different uh, intents there. So all of these things can have a hierarchical intent structure, which is also something that hierarchical summarization algorithms are worried about. Uh, we just use one level in this term level diversification for the time being. Uh, and this is the algorithm we use, DSP approx, which is quite an old algorithm in 2003. Actually, first proposed it in 2001. Uh, so this is what we did last year in terms of this uh, extraction. So to extract terms from retrieved documents, uh, we look at all non-stop words or phrases, that is what we call the vocabulary. Uh, and the topic terms are the words or phrases that occur near the query terms, in other words, within some window of, uh, of the text, near a query word. And we look at two measures, topicality and predictiveness. And topicality is the contribution to the kullback level divergence between the relevance model for uh, the uh, top rank. The, the relevance model is essentially just a language model constructed from the top retrieved documents for a query. There's a bit more detail to it than that, but it's your estimate of what the language model would be for the query. Uh, and uh, so we measure the callback lever divergence between the relevance model and the language model uh, for the entire collection for a particular term. Uh, this is also the contribution of that term to what's called the clarity score, which is a uh, thing that's been around for quite a long time, which predicts uh, how good a query is by comparing it to the, back of the language model for a query to the language model for the background. The more different a language model is to the background, the more likely you are to distinguish documents related to that topic uh, than a query that looks a lot like the, back, the background model. Uh, anyway, so topicality is a pretty well-known thing that's been around for a while. And then there's predictiveness, which measures how much the occurrence of a term predicts the occurrence of others. In other words, the hypothesis is here, from a summarization point of view, that uh, a summary, given a summary, even if it's 10, word lo 10 words long, we would hope that uh, a person seeing that summary could predict the other words that one would expect to see in the full document. Right? That seems like a pretty good measure of a summary if you can make predictions about what else you'd see. Uh, and here we're only talking about predictions at the vocabulary level. Okay? So we measure the predictiveness of a term by looking at co-occurrence probabilities within Windows. The co-occurrence of these candidate topic terms and the vocabulary. And so each of these candidate terms will predict a certain number of other terms, meaning they co-occur with them a lot. And uh, we greedily, uh, what we do is uh, do this by greedily taking the best term based on a, a product of these two com uh, um, factors. And uh, I'll explain this a little bit more in the next few slides. So we, we, take the, we take the best term and we reconfigure things and then we take the next best term and each time we take it the one that has the highest product of these two factors. And we keep going until we've got the number of terms that we want. And it's called DSP approx because this is an approximation to the dominating set problem, which is a problem in, in graphs, which tries to get the maximum coverage and predictability. And so, uh, yeah, so that's why it's called DSP approx. So uh, we start with vocabulary, there's the documents, there's a set of candidate topic terms, which, uh, which are words and phrases that co-occur with vocabulary within a certain amount of vocabulary. It can be the same vocabulary. It can be just be all the words and all the words again. But sometimes it's good to distinguish because, for example, if we're using phrases versus single words. And if we compute topicality here, which is this clarity measure or how good the topic term is in describing the documents that are out there in terms of their topicality, then we'll get some um, measure, you know, th this is reflecting how, how good these topic terms are with respect to their topicality. And then we look at how these things predict other terms. 
and uh, that will adjust the, uh, the measure somewhat, the size of the ball. So the top one there at the top is a combination of, it's a very topical term, you know, it's important to this, to all the topics, to the, the documents that are there, and it predicts some other uh, vocabulary, a number of the other vocabulary quite strongly. So we uh, take that one in this greedy approach, put it in our result set, and then we look at the vocabulary that it's predicted, and uh, we remove the vocabulary that's predicted only by that, and we'll downweight the, you notice the second term here, it is downweighted because we've already predicted that vocabulary, so we want to penalize that other term because it, that other topic term, because it predicts the same vocabulary. We don't want to keep predicting the same vocabulary, otherwise we'll end up with a whole bunch of vocabulary about the Java programming language and nothing else. We want to get down, we want to make sure we get to this other vocabulary down at the bottom here, so you've got to penalize this thing. And so in fact the next best one in the greedy approach is the top blue one, take that out, downweight things, and so forth going through there. I won't have time to go through the pseudo code, but there it is. Uh, so here's an example. It's a very simple algorithm. Just computes these two things, does a product, and grabs it off and, and, and downweights the stuff that's left. Uh, and uh, so these are the examples of some track queries uh, uh, and uh, the query joints, for example. Uh, these are the given subtopics for that track query. So there were subtopics about joints and human body, woodworking joint types are the ones I put up before, and there's another one about treating joint pain. Uh, so these are the given ones. And the DSP, uh, DSP approx algorithm, these are some of the uh, top ranked vocabulary terms that it chose as a summary for those top ranked documents. And we can see that there are words that correspond to each of these high level topics. Spine and articulate, minor, plantar, symptom, grief, I don't know about the grease one. Treating joint pain with grease. Uh, I didn't generate that example. Uh, and at the uh, phrase level, it's sometimes easier to read. Elbow joint, knee joint, minor joint, motor box, joint pain, joint pain inflammatory. So these are some of the top summary terms. They're clearly related to those high level track aspects. So we generate these automatically on the other hand, and so what we're going to do is to diversify them with respect to this list of phrases or words, rather than trying to infer what these high level concepts are. We're basically saying, who cares what they are, let's diversify with respect to this stuff and see how well we do. And uh, so this is the answer to that, how well we do. This is another one of those diversity measures, alpha and DCG. And, uh, so this is where we're using DSP of PROX to uh, generate a set of terms and then using the same diversity algorithm in every case, except for the baseline here, which doesn't use diversity at all. Uh, so that's uh, this method of generating the underlying vocabulary and diversifying, a nice improvement in the diversity measure. This is generating, uh, the, trying to infer the topics using k-nearest neighbor clustering, clustering the top ranked documents, then getting a representation of those clusters and using that to diversify, not nearly as good, and using LDA as a total disaster. Okay. Question? Yeah. So your top category and the predictive ability seems to uh, very coincide with the TFID. Um, very what with the TFID? Yeah, well, the yeah, topic, topicality is related. Yeah, it's, a, it's the clarity that it's well defined with respect to the language model representation of documents and the background model, etc. Right, that's still. What do you mean? That's the part.
to do that sort of calculation. So predictability is not the same thing as IDF. The, the callback label convergence is somewhat, is certainly related to TF, IDF stuff. Okay, but there is a separate component coming in beyond that. Now, at the, at the very high level, there's an ID, uh, a, a low IDF term is definitely more late, more likely to be a predictive term because it's going to be there's going to be a lot of occurrences of it, right? Uh, so yeah, there is that sort of connection. Uh, but uh, a low IDF term also has very low topicality. So, uh, I mean, a high IDF term has low topicality. So, if you're trying to look for something that optimizes both, you know, it's, it's, more, it's more to it than just TF and IDF. Uh, anyway, I'm not saying that DSP and PROX is the, the best, ulti most ultimate algorithm. This is not a talk saying you must use DSP and PROX. It's saying you can, by summarizing the vocabulary of a set of documents, you can generate better retrieval diversity than trying to infer the high level topic structure of that set of documents. Okay, that's the takeaway message. Uh, I don't care what summarization algorithm you use. Uh, you know, I imagine if you use a really bad one, in fact, it wouldn't work as well. In fact, we've had a lot of trouble. We have yet to beat DSP at Prox, despite in, in this context, uh, using a lot of other algorithms, learning to rank algorithms, etc. Uh, but I'm not saying that's the final word, and that's not the point. The point is that summarization is a really crucial part of this approach to diversity. Okay? Uh, so that's what I've got talking about here. We, that uh, term generation is diversification. But uh, I sort of lost my track a little here. Um, term vocabulary, documents, topics. Um, I think I'll just skip that term for forgetting what I was going to say about it then. Yeah. Um, right. And what I was basically saying is what I, was, what I wanted to say here is what I mentioned earlier. So we've got this idea that summarization can help diversity, but on the other hand, the summarization algorithm, like DSP or PROX, is trying to generate a set of vocabulary which is, has good coverage and in some ways has to be diverse as well. It has to cover the vocabulary and be diverse in order to cover all the uh, top less frequent topics. So uh, we've got the idea of diversifying across vocabulary using the summarization algorithm and diversifying across topics using our uh, diversity framework. So what we looked at was we sort of scratching our head and saying we're doing diversification followed by diversification. It seems like this is, we're doing two, two, two rounds of the same thing here. Can we unify this process of summarization and then more summarization or diversification first, followed by more diversification. Can we unify it some way? And the answer is we haven't been able to. We tried to though. So uh, I explained DSP or PROX about it iteratively selecting topic terms that are highly topical and can predict the occurrences of part of the vocabulary that haven't been covered. XQuad greedily selects documents that are relevant to the query and can provide coverage for the topics that those selected previously failed to provide. This is the, the mathematical framework for x -quad. These are the definitions of topicality. And you, you know, so there's some things in there like, like IDF. And this is the predictiveness of the co-occurrence measure. Um, but, and this one is, is uh, up, you greedily select documents based on a combination of how likely, how, how uh, highly ranked they are with respect to the query, and then looking at the, the uh, relationship of the documents and the topics, these are the high level topics in this framework. Uh, this component here is measuring how much that topic has already been covered. So you're trying to select, imagine that for each topic you've got a rank of if you've got some highly ranked documents, you're trying to select the most highly ranked document for a topic that hasn't been covered before. That's the part that's measuring that hasn't been covered before. This part is trying to look at what's the highest ranked document for that topic. Okay? So you're selecting highly ranked 
documents, but discounting by uh, the topics that you've already seen. Uh, so that's the XQuad framework. Uh, we tried using this framework because this is we can you can directly use this framework for this problem. In other words, you replace instead of trying to get a broad coverage across the topics, you say, well, what we want to get is we want to rank topics that have a broad coverage across vocabulary. And we can replace these probability estimations with probabilities that are related to topics in vocabulary. And so instead of DSP and prox, we could use an XQuad type approach to ranking the vocabulary. Uh, and we did that and tried various variations of it, and it doesn't work. It doesn't, well, it works, but it doesn't work as well. And the reason is that DSP and prox, this heuristic, greedy uh, approximation to DSP, uh, really essentially removes terms after they've been predicted by, uh, the removes vocabulary after uh, they've been predicted by some term. Whereas X quad merely downweights it somewhat. And this drastic downweighting that DSP approx is, does is much more appropriate when you're selecting from vocabulary than you are selecting from topics, than it is uh, relative to topics. And that's one of, you can, you can see why vocabulary, remember you've got potentially thousands and thousands of vocabulary terms. With topics, you're only talking about a very small number of topics. And so with the vocabulary, once terms are predicted, it's better just to throw them out, essentially, and then look at the other vocabulary. And it just turns out that that's sort of drastic downweighting. Uh, in fact, if we put more drastic discounting into this formula here, that's one form of discounting. We put more drastic forms of discounting in there, and then the performance gets a lot closer to DSP of rocks. OK, so. Uh, yeah, so there's some relationship there, but it doesn't transform that easily. Uh, DSP and PROX only uses two features. As I said, there's no reason to believe it's the, the be-all and end-all of summarization. So can we do better than that? Uh, we tried a lot of things in the TREK context and haven't done better than that yet. I'm still waiting for somebody to do better than that. Uh, we, all, we did, in another completely other context, do better than uh, DSP and PROX using a learning to rank approach just by throwing in more features, basically, uh, which is another standard IR approach, right? Throw more stuff in and learn something about it, and uh, often it will do well. So in this uh, scenario, we have a query document, and we want to generate a list of, uh, so not a query, but a query document. So the scenarios here are things like literature search, where you have an existing paper, or uh, patent retrieval, where you have a patent application, you're looking for other patents that are related to this patent. So rather than generating queries, this, this hypothesis, this assumes that you're going to give the system the document. So well, here's the document. Now find the other stuff that looks like this document. You know, so why go through the process of specifying queries if you don't have to? Uh, so uh, that's the scenario here. So what we did to generate this uh, diverse list of documents with respect to this query document is to identify topic phrases in the query document and do proportionally, proportionality based diversification with respect to these topic phrases. So the same sort of diversity framework. Um, and we compared two ways of generating that topic vocabulary. One is DSP to prox, and one was learning to rank uh, based on a combination of features. We trained it actually using DSP of prox on relevant documents on a, for a different set of queries uh, because we can generate lots of queries in this patent world. Uh, and we combine, uh, we have topicality and predictiveness in there because they, they are good features. They end up being two of the most important features. Uh, but we also added in some other things, other query performance predictors like query scope and things like cohesiveness various other measures about uh, um, how important phrases are and how well they describe the corpus and things like that. Just threw more features in there and, you, and trained it using this uh, artificial training data. Uh, we use, these are evaluated on various patent collections. The relevance judgments that we assumed in this type of task is that we try and 
Uh, we use the cited patents as the relevant documents, and there are problems with that, especially in the patent world, less so in the, in the uh, academic literature world, and evaluated it using all the usual diversity measures. So this is a relevance evaluation. I, should, I thought I should just mention this, is that one of the side effects of this retrieval diversity algorithms is that they often end up doing better just in straight relevance evaluation than the non-diverse ranking. So that it's, wasn't designed for that, but it actually works that way in nearly every evaluation. So this is uh, the relevance evaluation, and the orange bar is DSP, and the green bar is the learning to rank approach. So small improvement. Uh, there was significance in a couple of these measures. These are different measures down the bottom. And this is the diversity evaluation, which shows there's a bigger, the baseline is uh, you know, a non-diverse ranking. So, as you'd expect, with a diversity evaluation, there's a bigger difference between the baseline and the measures that try and do diversity. Uh, but when looking at comparing the two, we did, yes, consistently very small improvements using these additional features. So, that's the one time we've beaten DSP and PROX so far. Um, you know, I think it's an interesting challenge to try and beat it because it doesn't seem like that complicated a, an approach to doing summarization. It just turned out to be very effective for quite a number of years. Okay. So, uh, talked about this term-based diversification, how summarization feeds into diversification, how diversification should be able to use for summarization too, but in fact it doesn't work just because of the characteristics of the problem. A straightforward application doesn't work. Um, I wanted to tell you about another application where we're using this combination of summarization and diversification, which is opinion mining. Uh, in this specific one case, in this specific case, what this means is we're trying to do the task of given a query, what's the most important topics related to that that have been discussed recently on Twitter. Okay. Uh, so how are you going to do that? So uh, one approach would be clustering, as I mentioned before. That's, that's, you see some papers out there already trying to do that. Our initial approach has been to use DSP and PROX on phrases and, and hashtags and retrieve tweets. Uh, when we did this initial approach, our users, we're working with an industry partner and the users immediately want to know about uh, the redundancy of topics with respect to tweets that would be retrieved, which right, straight away talked about another type of coverage. We talked about vocabulary coverage and diversity talks about this topic coverage. They wanted to know about coverage of the entire document space. In other words, have I which is related to the topic coverage, but it's not exactly identical. In other words, they want to know uh, how much redundancy is there if I use these, each of these topics that you're presenting me with as a query. Is there a lot of document overlap? You, you expect not because of it, there's a lot of vocabulary overlap, but in fact there's sometimes a document overlap. And also how much of the documents of the, of the most recent tweets have I covered? What percentage have I covered with this set of queries that were represented by these topics. Um, and they also wanted this hierarchy of topics. I mentioned that as a possibility. We haven't done it yet, but that was the first, one of the first things they asked for, is they wanted to drill down in this hierarchy. Uh, and DSP and PROX has been used for hierarchical summarization. Uh, it's not that all that satisfactory. I'm not aware of a totally satisfactory measure. Some of these more recent approaches that uh, people here are working on may actually uh, be better for that. Okay, so uh, we use DSP and PROX, uh, a learning to rank approach uh, that seems, seems to be another approach to improve that. Uh, another whole approach to doing this opinion mining is rather than trying to summarize what the opinions are that are being talked about, what are the topics that are being talked about, so this is not sentiment, by the way, but opinions. We talk about those as different things. Sentiment is a, is it good or bad? Opinions is asking what are, what are, what topics are people talking about? What's hot? Right? That's completely different. They're different dimensions. 
so uh, another way to do this is just to show diversified retrieval and then interactively let people in further topics. So you can show a diversified list of tweets, you know, the, the one, the list of tweets that is according to your diversity algorithm covering the underlying topics and then let them say, oh, that one looks interesting, show me more like that one, that one looks interesting. So interactively exploring the space of, of uh, tweets using a diversity algorithm versus explicitly trying to summarize the tweets. We're doing combining both at the moment. And then there's the question, well, how are you going to evaluate this stuff? Uh, one way is to uh, do a social science task, is what we're actually doing. But you can also, interestingly, potentially evaluate a task-based evaluation where we evaluate summarization using diversified retrieval. I'll explain that in a sec. So this is the interface from Adobe who is using this stuff in their social, um, social query discovery system. And so type in a query like Adobe and you get back this list of phrases and this list of hashtags here. And uh, these are generated by the DS pre prox algorithm. And uh, so far, surprisingly, they've been pretty happy with the quality of the stuff coming back uh, just using the DSP approx algorithm. So this is uh, just using summarization. Uh, we've done another, our own version of the demo, which is emphasizing more generating the uh, diversified list of tweets following that and using interaction to explore the space. But here's some more examples. This is this on a they're doing on, this thing is running on all the recent tweets from the last month or so, something like that. This one is running on a sample of Twitter that we just happen to have lying around, fairly small, one month of Twitter from 2009. Uh, so uh, the query is World Cup. These are the, uh, the DSP of Prox phrases for World Cup for Twitter and that thing, and so you can see gives you some idea about what people are talking about there. Uh, if you click on one of those, like New Zealand, uh, then you get back the list of tweets uh, related to World Cup in New Zealand. And uh, once again, if you're going to do a sort of a hierarchical thing here, you could as a, uh, try to let people interactively explore this by diversifying this list as much as possible. Another reason you can do things like expand the phrases to related phrases. That's sort of a hierarchical thing, seeing the next level down. And uh, then you can do the same thing in the hashtag space, which is like a different representation of tweets. Okay, so how do we evaluate this stuff? Uh, as I said, what we're doing right now is to evaluate it using the rankings that are produced by these summaries. And uh, what we're going to do is try and generate a diverse Twitter ranking, which people haven't done that yet, of doing diversity in tweet ranking. And the question with that is, well, how do you evaluate that? That doesn't make it any easier. Uh, because you need some notion of what the underlying topics are. And you can't use DSP or Prox to generate those topics because that would be cheating, right? So in this case, it seemed to us like the obvious example was, Gee, we need a manual classification of what these tweets are about. And it seems like to us that that's exactly what hashtags are. But they're a little noisy, but they're in fact a manual assignment by people to essentially, in a lot of cases, existing categories represented by a hashtag. So what we've been doing is to use hashtags as a ground truth, manually assigned categories about underlying topics with respect to the topic of our query. And uh, then we evaluate our diversity algorithms on the text part of the tweet by evaluating how well we are covering the hashtags that are related to those tweets. Right? So hashtags are the categories, manual categories, and we do algorithms on the text part of the tweets and we try different diversity algorithms and see how measure how well we're doing by looking at the coverage of the hashtags. Uh, and uh, that's, that's all this thing here says, goes through all these steps about how you do that. 
Um, you know, there's various issues about uh, whether the, does a tweet have to contain all the, uh, the main query tag as well as the sub tags in order to be a, a valid tweet or not. We've tried it both ways, it doesn't make that much difference. Uh, what it turns out is that uh, you get pretty good evaluations um, of diversity using that sort of approach, which is totally automatic, obviously. Uh, but here is a run on that one of the uh, Twitter databases we have. This is uh, Alpha NDC2. These are the diversity measures. All these different things are all different diversity measures. This is the query likelihood model, which doesn't use diversity. Uh, this is the relevant feedback, shooter relevant feedback run here, it does a little bit better. MMR is a disaster. Uh, and then the proportional um, the mechanism and the uh, framework and the XPOD framework. And you can see they do substantially better in these diversity measures. There's not much difference between them. And this reflects exactly the sort of results we see with document diversity evaluations as well. But there's not much difference between these two frameworks. Sometimes one's better than the other. Uh, but they typically are substantially better than the non-diversity frameworks when you evaluate them using these diversity measures. <coughs> uh, and, yeah, so the point of that is that given that we, this seems to be a reasonable way of evaluating diversity in the Twitter world, uh, that we can now try a whole different set of, a whole bunch of different algorithms for summarization. Remember the, the diverse rankings here are generated using summarizations on the Twitter space. Things like DSP and Prox. And so we can evaluate different new approaches to summarization uh, by seeing how well it generates a diverse ranking. Yeah, that's on this, this task of based evaluation assumes that better summarization means better diversification. Okay? So uh, then we'll be able to say, well, this algorithm uh, is better than DSP or Prox for this task, which is an important task. So that's an, an also an example of how we have to play it. We're not going to manually annotate all these tweets, but you can exploit existing data to generate valid uh, Evaluations and learn a lot from these things totally, totally automatically. So here's my conclusions. Uh, as I say, which are going to be wishy-washy. I left a question mark off here. Uh, diversity and summarization keep coming up together. Uh, so ranking diversification, you could view it as improving some property of a result summary. You know, that's what you're presented with when you do a search, it is a form of summary. And diversification is trying to improve a property of that summary. Uh, Term-based diversity uses a summarization algorithm to improve diversity. So we have, once again, this circularity here. We haven't sorted that out yet. Seems like maybe there's one optimization we could do over everything that might work better, but we haven't worked that out yet. Uh, and we also have to include other uh, properties and features in this notion of diversity and summarization, uh, like topic hierarchies, uh, diversity across entities. Well, we talk about different types of vocabularies. I was just talking about the word vocabulary, but there's also an entity vocabulary, there's a time vocabulary, and there's a sentiment vocabulary. And we really want diversity in each of those dimensions. Uh, which is fine, except now how do we summarize across multiple dimensions in any sort of understandable way? Uh, just presenting clusters doesn't really uh, do a good job of summarizing clearly across multiple dimensions. So uh, this is still an unknown about how do we do that. Uh, uh, I think an interesting area. Uh, so any system using summaries and retrieval has to consider diversity. If you're doing diversification, you have to consider summarization. That's really the uh, main point of what I was saying today. And hopefully I've given you some insight into diversity and how summarization plays into that. Okay, thank you. Or have you moved
Yeah, well, as I said, we tried using our diversity frameworks for the turn-based summaries, right? Right, yeah. Uh, but we weren't able to do better that way. Oh, okay. It was substantially worse, in fact, because of the problem that you're... That's right, yeah. You've got this huge vocabulary versus relatively small set of topics and the need to heavily discount the, the vocabulary you've already predicted. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think that's something to continue to look at. But, yeah, I have, I have a real problem with saying we looked at summarization as a problem in itself. I'd much prefer to look at summarization as a part of something. Like, as a part of a diversity framework, to me it makes sense. As a part of producing an optimal result list, that makes sense. It's something I can evaluate. If you just say, well, is this a better summary than that? Uh, that's where you get into problems. Uh, there are ways to do that, but it's often very qualitative in nature in terms of saying this is a better summary than that summary. That's a really good point. So maybe people are doing this right now and using information from people like that to evaluate their summaries instead of using the summary. Well, that is, you know, that's, uh, the diversity is a good task to, to evaluate this type of summary for. No, it's not all types of summaries, but this type of term or phrase based summarization are really, it's a good way of evaluating that. Good question off the top of me. Sorry, I missed that. Personalized summarization. Um, uh, in, in, you mean in what particular, what sort of summaries are we talking about? But, Yeah, so personalized snippet generation, for example. That, that would be a form of personalized summarization. Um, uh, you know, obviously, people worked on personalizing the result list in terms of the documents that you see. Uh, and that can certainly, there are cases when that uh, it helps. But in terms of what I'm talking about, the personalized snippet generation would probably be closer uh, to trying to do that. Personalization is another one of those things I have a problem with, like summarization in its, in its own. I'm taking it on its own. Personalization, uh, you know, I, I much prefer to work with longer queries, like description, in the Trek world, it means description links, They're like a question, and not factoid questions where, like, how high is Mount Everest, but just longer questions where, like, you talk to a person and uh, when you're trying to find out some information from them, so you don't give them keywords, you actually put it in a sentence, you give it some context, some surrounding words, and that helps the person find the information. Uh, that's one of the key problems, I think, that we need to keep working on in information retrieval, because right now we can take more, uh, in some cases, in a lot of cases, you give me a more precise query and I can't do any better. In fact, I do worse than the keyword query. Uh, and so that's a big problem. So getting back to your problem, uh, Personalization in the search world, uh, a lot of it has to do, previous work has to do with if you start with these queries which are not that interesting like Java, then personalize has to do with, well, how should I interpret, which intent are they probably talking about? So you know, this person is a coffee fanatic, so almost for certain their Java query is about the coffee Java. You know, so that's the sort of personalization you there's a lot of papers out like that. And that sort of personalization disappears when you have longer queries. Uh, you know, where, where can I buy the best coffee beans from Java? From Java? And that's a coffee query about the island, actually. It doesn't throw a little confusion. Um, but it, then you can have a chance of, uh, you can understand what that's about. You don't have to understand what the intent is because you've got a better description of the query. And personalization becomes less important there. So, um, yeah, I think some work on personalization is interesting. Uh, obviously, location personalization is interesting, but um, location, personalized summaries, um, yeah, I mean, in the sense we're doing query based, I don't want to get, I'm happy staying with query based summaries right now as long as the queries are specific enough. Yeah? I, uh, I also tried using the RDA document. 
Well, K-Me, well, actually, K-Me's did work better, but uh, both of them were not very good. Uh, I, I, with the LDA, I just, well, doing it on the top-ranked documents primarily, I'm just not sure that there's enough data there for LDA to work properly. Yeah, I think it was a bit frustrating, you know, the LDA, Yeah, which is, uh, this is why, uh, the problem with summarizing vocabulary, you've got a more reasonable amount of data to do, you know, the amount of data you have to do a reasonable summary is, is it's more appropriate, the amount of data from the top ranked documents to do a summary rather than the amount of data to build an accurate LDA model.